Hey you guys, I'm Dr. Nicole Peoples and welcome back to my channel. Today we're gonna to talk about a concept that may sound complicated, but it's actually really simple, which is epigenetics. It is the impact that your lifestyle actually has on your health. And so if you're interested in understanding how your behaviors affect the way you feel, look and age, well, you wanna watch the rest of this video because we're gonna talk about how you get to the root cause of your symptoms, how you figure out what the lifestyle approach to a healthy life is and why the way we're currently doing things isn't going to cut it if you're trying to live a healthy long life. So let's get started. So what in the world is epigenetics and why should you care? So for the longest time, most people thought that their health was determined by their genetics, meaning that if your mother had a disease, your father had a disease, that you were gonna have that disease. And that actually might be your experience. It might in fact be true for you that your mother had diabetes, your father had diabetes, and now you are developing diabetes or whatever the symptom is or disease. But that is a result of something that is totally within your control, which is called epigenetics. Epigenetics is the environment's impact on your genes. And so what does that mean? It means that if you eat the same things, have the same sort of behaviors, the movement patterns, live in the same sort of area, have the same sort of habits as your parents, and you have the genetic predisposition for a particular disease, then you will likely develop that disease. It's not your solely your genes responsible, it's sort of your behavior. Now, why should you care about any of this at all? Is because if you're interested, if you want to, figure out, you know, hey, listen, I'm at risk for this particular condition or I'm concerned that I may develop this condition. Is there anything that I can do to help me prevent getting it? Then the answer is yes. And that is the whole point of all of this is that there are a group of people out here who will always want to ignore the research on how to stay healthy. But then there's this other subset of people who are like, no, if I can avoid it, I totally would avoid it. That's me. So let me tell you how you can influence your epigenetics. So I practice a form of medicine called functional medicine. If you followed me, then you know this already. But for those of you who are new, functional medicine, I like to equate to either root cause medicine or lifestyle medicine. So that basically means how am I going to influence my environment so that I can have the greatest impact of my genes. I want the healthiest genes to thrive and I want the disease genes to, you know, not be around anymore or not cause me drama anymore. It's becoming more popular in science, but what you'll notice is that most doctors aren't tapping into this. And there's a good reason for this. I don't want you to think your doctors are bad. The issue is, is that most doctors aren't trained to address epigenetics. That's number one. But number two, your conventional doctor that you go to on a regular basis is trained to identify disease. And that's great because if you develop a disease, you want to go to somebody who can actually help you treat it. But if you're in the, the realm of preventing disease, or if you want to take a more natural approach, even if you have a disease, then you definitely want to consider your epigenetics. As a matter of fact, everybody should consider their epigenetics regardless of where you are. But you can use epigenetics and conventional medicine synergistically, but if you want to avoid going down the conventional medicine route altogether, then you want to prevent disease. And that's where I come in. So let's talk about how you use lifestyle to improve your health. So there are seven areas that I focus on when I talk about epigenetics. And those seven areas are based on the science of epigenetics. It's based off of the things that we know about our lifestyle that influences health or disease. And there are a number, there are more than seven things that influence health or disease, but these seven are the core ones. So I've broken them down into personal life, which is your uh, intention, your mindset, right? These are things that you may think are maybe even woo-woo or esoteric, but it's really important to whether or not you're going to actually achieve behavior change or a lifestyle change in the first place. How you think about your health, your perspective, setting an intention is the only thing that actually keeps you in a habit. So this is a really important first place to start. 
Number two is food life. So we talk about food a lot. We talk about nutrition, um, but oftentimes it can get very confusing because there is not a one size fits all. So when people ask me, what's the perfect diet? There isn't a perfect diet for everybody. There are some core principles that I think regardless of what your health issues are, you should absolutely implore. But for most people, you need to personalize your diet for you and what your health goals are. So that's food life. We talk about nutrition, how to use food as medicine. We talk about how to use fasting and intermittent fasting and restricted uh, eating. All of these things fall under food life. Then we talk about sleep life. So sleep is my next one. I mean, they're all, I can't, I couldn't rate it if you asked me to. I couldn't rate which one is most important of the seven. But sleep life is really high up there because if you're not sleeping, everything else goes to, you know, shit. So what you really wanna be able to do is make sure if at minimum that you're paying attention to your sleep because the majority of my patients or people I know aren't thinking about how their sleep is impacting their cravings, their weight, their mood, their mindset, any of the things that influence their overall health. They're not really considering how sleep might be impacting it. And so if you're sleeping like four hours or six hours a night, then you really need to focus on sleep life because that's going to influence everything else. All right, so the next one is resilient life. So this has to do with stress. So of course we all experience stress, but the question is, is how do we manage it? And in our culture, we haven't really been trained how to manage stress. We're trained to maybe just push through it, right? Like, oh, things are gonna be stressful and you just gotta gun your way through it. Or we retreat and we become depressed and anxious, or we develop trauma. I mean, a lot of things around stress, but we don't ever talk about, is there a way for us to balance our stress levels? And because I'm a scientist, I'm a medical doctor, I always think of things in terms of chemicals and biochemistry. And there is a biochemical explanation to why you feel stressed, why stress actually impacts whether or not you develop high blood pressure or cancer or any chronic disease for that matter. There is a biologic explanation. And so when I talk about treating stress, I'm talking about addressing the biologic reason, the hormonal imbalances, the chemical imbalances. But how do you do that? Isn't by some miracle drug or some miracle nutrient, although those can be very helpful, but you do that by regulating your nervous system. And that is done by really simple lifestyle behaviors that if you were never trained to do, you should probably take some time to learn them. And there are things as simple as breath work meditation, mindfulness. These aren't, you know, what most people might consider to be, you know, high tech interventions, but sometimes the simplest solutions are the most effective. So that's resilient life. The next one is fit life. So we talk about fitness all the time. My timeline is covered with things about fitness. And fitness is misunderstood, maybe the best way to describe it. It's because, you know, there's a lot of misinformation about what's the right fitness program, what should you do, should you do cardio, should you do weightlifting, all, uh, there's a little bit of truth in all of it. So that's why it gets a, a little bit confusing, but then, there's also this component where what's right for a 20 year old man may not be right for a 45 perimenopausal woman. You would think that these things could be tailored, personalized for a better word, um, to the person and what their specific needs are. The other thing that I think gets lost is there's a difference in what you wanna do if you wanna be a fitness trainer or a bodybuilder versus you just want to be healthy and you want to live a long healthy life and be able to be mobile without pain well into your 60s 70s 80s and 90s right and then there's also a different approach if you've already got chronic illnesses that you're trying to reverse right so depending on the chronic condition you're having your fitness goals might change if you've got heart disease or diabetes or an autoimmune condition your approach to all of these might be different. And so it's important to understand these nuances when developing a fitness routine. 
So the next one is detox. This one is, I'm not gonna say it's my favorite, but I wanna say it's my favorite only because everybody ignores it. <laughs> so in our conventional medical system, we don't really talk about the impact that toxins have on our health. So we see this huge rise in infertility, we see this huge rise in ADHD or autism or cancer, and we, as a conventional medicine society, say, well, we don't really know why these things happen. Yet there is tons of research that can link certain toxins to all of these conditions. The problem is, is that some of the research isn't clear causative. Basically means that I can't say that if you drink out of a water bottle that that's what's caused your depression, right? But what I can say is that there are chemicals in water bottles that increase the risk of depression. So how do you deal with this you know, discrepancy in the potential of having a cause of a disease and there not being definitive research? Well, the way that I approach it is minimize risk, right? And to minimize risk, we have to think, number one, about the risk factors to begin with. So what are the factors, the chemicals in the environment that we know can impact chronic illnesses like fertility or weight gain or cancer? There are no shortage of research to actually talk about the chemicals that are related to just about any condition. So rather than getting really specific or tied down into the specifics of how do you get rid of all toxins in the environment, that would be a mute point. The question then becomes, how do you reduce your toxic load and how do you improve your body's ability to detoxify? And that is something we can actually intervene upon. And so detox life is all about figuring out how to minimize your toxic exposures and how to enhance your body's ability to detoxify. All right, so the next one is connected life. And this is another one that I think that people might think is kind of woo woo, it's not really effective, it's not gonna like change anything, but the reality is is that people's uh, life expectancy is extremely shortened if they are isolated, if they don't have a place of connection. And so when we talk about the progression of disease, the development of disease, whether or not you develop a mental health issue like depression, anxiety, all of these things are impacted by your environment and your relationships in that environment and whether or not you feel socially connected. And I'll tell you that, you know, the food part, the fitness part, the sleep part, the stress mat maintenance part, all of those are actually pretty good for me. Like those areas, I'm always working on it because it's always a journey. There's always places for me to improve, but those things I pretty much have in the bag. The connection part, I don't know, you probably might think that I'm you know, pretty social, but I'm really an introvert. And the connection part is actually quite difficult for me. So that's the area that I really have to work on. So when I'm doing all of this preaching to people about how to eat and how to work out and how to manage their stress and how to detoxify and how to sleep better, the thing that I struggle with the most is connection. So that's the part that I work on the most. And again, yours might be something else. You might be the social butterfly, everybody um, loves you and you love to be out with people and connecting with people and that's where you get your energy from. That may not be an issue for you, but I bet you there's somebody who's watching this who's like, no, connection is the one for me too. So I just wanna highlight that one because it seems like it's, something that people don't really think about, but for a lot of us, and I think in this day and age of social media and texting and lack of like real in-person interaction, connection is becoming a more prominent one. So I think I went through all seven. Those are, the, that is the framework for which we address health. And this is the framework that if you're interested in preventing disease, treating things naturally, you have to understand these seven areas. Now, the last point I'll make about these seven areas is that these are the core ones. There are some, what I would call advanced prescriptions or what I would call the people's life prescriptions, the advanced people's life prescriptions. These are things like hormones or gut health or energy or mitochondria. These are other areas that are more advanced, but here's the thing, the first seven all influence your hormone levels, 
your microbiome or your gut health, your energy balance, or your mitochondrial health. And so when you start to address each of these, you'll start to notice that you have a impact on all of the other health factors. And this is the thing about root cause medicine. When you treat the root causes of illness, you actually cover the whole spectrum of health and disease. And that's why treating the root is really the first place we should always start. Starting up at the symptoms or the disease states can be important if you're in acute illness, like the patients I see in the hospital. But if you're a person who has a chronic condition or preventing a chronic condition or just trying to stay healthy, you wanna start with the roots because when you start with the roots, you cover so, much, um, so many more things. All right, you guys, so this is the end of this video. If this has been interesting to you, please leave a comment below. Let me know what you think. Let me know what questions you have. And in my further videos, I will break down each of these separately so that you can have a better understanding of each of these. So this was just an overview. All right, you guys, I'll see you in the next video.